please join me in welcoming our moderator, Sharon Bedell. Hi, everybody. Um, good evening. Thanks for coming. We're so thrilled to have such a great turnout, and uh, we're going to move right along. I am the, sh the head short film programmer for the Tribeca Film Festival, so um, I spend months in my pajamas in front of the television watching all your wonderful submissions and finally narrowing them down. And <clears throat> I've been with Tribeca since the festival's inception. I also am a member of the faculty at NYU, Tisch School of the Arts, undergrad film and TV, where I've been teaching for 17 years. And um, I wrote a book called Swimming Upstream, A Life-Saving Guide to Short Film Distribution, which was published in 2008. I'm going to ask each of our panelists to give their own bio. For those of you who didn't get the written bio, we are going to put it up on the Tribeca Film Institute website. So if you didn't get one, you can check the website and um, you'll be able to, to access it from there. Okay, so uh, I'm going to turn it over to our panelists for a moment. Thank you. Just your best, just a um, bit about what you're about. So my name is Sandy Dubowski, and I wear sort of many hats, which is maybe the theme of, of today. Um, a director, I directed a film called Trembling Before God. I am also a producer, so I produced A Jihad for Love and co-produced Boudros. Um, the outreach director for this initiative called The Good Pitch, um, which is a high-impact pitching forum. Um, we select social issue documentaries, um, we, including Mackey's, um, The Truth Will Set You Free, and we convene these forums um, in New York and San Francisco that bring together brands, funders, television, technology, nonprofits to try to form coalitions um, and impact funding, distribution, outreach. So, sort of many hats. Hi, uh, <clears throat> I'm Moon Molson. I am a short filmmaker. Um, I made a film called Pop Foul in 2007. It um, played at about over 100 film festivals, as, um, including Sundance in 2007. Um, I also, this year, made a film called Crazy Beat Strong Every Time um, that just premiered at the Sundance Film Festival uh, 2011. Um, I also did the uh, Sundance Writers and Directors Labs in 2008. Hi, uh, I'm Boo Boo Kakati, and I'm a writer, director, producer, editor, gopher, whatever. Um, I'm actually, I went to film school at Tisch, did my MFA program there, and then um, I went out to LA and, and won a grant called um, the Power Up Directing Grant where I, I made a short film with Melanie Linsky. And then I came back to New York um, and was freelancing here and there. And then I um, started working for WNYE and sort of uh, found this great opportunity where I was suddenly um, you know, show running and writing and producing a uh, documentary series, a historical documentary series called Secrets of New York. and. Um, I did that for several years and won some Emmys along the way, and then um, and then sort of um, decided to move into advertising a little bit, and um, also sort of uh, producing and pitching my own kind of television shows. And I've of course been involved with the Tribeca Film Institute, with um, Tribeca All Access Program, screenwriting. So um, I've done a number of different projects, um, and I think this panel is a great idea because. Um, there are a lot of things that you think about um, in terms of making money and trying to make money as, as a filmmaker and the other way around. So uh, thank you all for coming. My name is Mackie Alston. I'm a documentary film director, among other things. And uh, I've made five feature docs, so I'm making my fifth. They've all uh, they've been on HBO, uh, Discovery Films, and PBS. Uh, my first film premiered at Sundance in 1997. Um, and since then, I've been trying to crack the code of how to make a living as a documentary film director, which is, you know, sort of jokes on you situation. <laughs> but I've done it. Now I'm the proud um, provider for my husband and two children. And in the course of this panel, I'll tell you how that happened. Not the parent part, but the providing part. <laughs> 
Hi, I'm Rodney Evans, and I directed a feature called Brother to Brother uh, that premiered at Sundance in 2004. Um, <clears throat> it played at Berlin, and it also uh, played on the PBS series Independent Lens in June of 2005. Um, I have been developing my second feature for the past couple years called Daydream, and it's about the jazz musician Billy Strayhorn. And <clears throat> there's a short version of that film called Billy and Aaron that um, Sharon actually programmed at the Tribeca Film Festival last year. Wow, it's already been a year. <laughs> and uh, I also teach at uh, uh, Temple University, and I've taught at Cooper Union and School of Visual Arts and a couple of other colleges, and um, I'm glad to be here. Okay, so what we're going to do first is <clears throat> I have some questions that are pointed at specific individuals, and then I'll ask anybody else who wants to chime in on the same question. That would be great. So the first one um, is Moon. I would love it if you would talk about how your short film, and Rodney too, how the short films helped and fit into your career path. <clears throat> Hello? Um, the short films. Um, my first uh, short um, went to the Sundance Film Festival, as I said before, and um, I was able to secure a manager and agent by screening at that festival. So um, through them, I was able to take meetings in Hollywood and um, attempt to develop projects in Hollywood. So, um, but I think that might be like, that was like kind of a lucky situation. I think there's a lot of filmmakers that even play at Sundance that don't necessarily get seen by managers and agents. and so. Um, sometimes uh, their career kind of stalls out there um, as far as Hollywood goes. I think that's... Um, I guess, I, you know, I come from an experimental documentary background, so Brother to Brother was really um, <clears throat> the end result of a lot of the work that I was doing in short. So I, I had done a video diary piece called Close to Home that dealt with me coming out to my conservative Jamaican family. And, um, and you know, there are specific scenes in that film that led me into an interest in screenwriting and thinking about, you know, what it would be like to actually construct a, a narrative feature kind of revolving around different experiences that I had gone through. So that was sort of a di direct result of short filmmaking. And then the most recent short, Billy and Aaron, is really a 10 minute chunk of this feature, Daydream. So the real goal with that was to try to kind of <clears throat> pull a piece that could stand on its own, but then also give a flavor of the kind of larger narrative piece. And, uh, you know, in, as opposed to just having words on a paper, you can actually have something to show that like gives people a sense of the feeling of what your feature is gonna be. So that's been really helpful in terms of- Did you have the show. feature script written fully and then Ex excerpted the, sh the what you wanted to do with the short? Yeah, I know that a lot of times it, it works either way, where people expand a short. But I, I had done the feature and was actually in a four-month development feature development program um, at a place called the Binger Film Lab in Amsterdam. And it basically is uh, a place where they invite directors from all over the world to come to Amsterdam for four months and develop a feature film script. And, and it's very similar to the Sundance Lab, except it's longer and in Amsterdam. <laughs> and uh, so, yes, it was very much uh, an outgrowth of that program. And I was able to find actors in Amsterdam and find a great kind of art deco period location and just shoot for, uh, and the whole thing was shot in eight hours, but it really helped a lot with just in terms of kind of knowing the world of the feature and being able to kind of illustrate that for, for people. Yeah, just to, just to build on what Rodney said, my second short um, is actually the opposite situation where I expanded the short into a feature, and that feature was developed at the Sundance Labs in 2008. And so, um, just as Rodney said, uh, the short, when I finally was able to get money for the short, which was after the Sundance Labs, um, I made sure that the short could stand on its own as like a complete story. So it didn't feel like, an, like a scene or an excerpt from, um, from the feature, but represented the feature um, just as well. Um, let's get a sense of who you all are. Okay, if you are a film student, one of mine or someone else's, please raise your hand. Okay. If you are an aspiring filmmaker, but not necessarily a film student, raise your hand. 
If you are an aspiring writer or professional writer, raise your hand. If you're just here for a good time, <laughs> raise your hand. Uh, anybody specifically uh, leans, that leans towards documentary format, raise your hand. Cool. And anybody specifically involved with experimental filmmaking, raise your hand. Okay. Animation? Cool. Anything you don't understand. <laughs> I mean, really, it's kind of this melange of, of traditionally nonlinear format. So something that doesn't necessarily have a clear story progression or and quite often uses many different multimedia techniques and often encompasses archive footage or foot found footage or, you know, it's very much no rules. Okay. Um, Bubu, this is the golden question. How can you pursue a parallel career alongside an artistic one? Um, yeah, I guess this is something that I'm always battling with. Um, you know, I, I came out of film school with um, several short films, and they went to festivals and, and all of that. Um, and I didn't fall into sort of Moon's path of, say, um, getting a manager and then sort of, you know, making another short and, you know, making a feature or, or whatever, just sort of like into that track that you think is what comes out of film school, you know, sort of the auteur track or whatever. So um, what happened with me was that I started off narrative filmmaking. I mean, we did do documentaries as well. And... Um, uh, after that, I sort of, um, you know, I was in LA and I, and I made this film and it was great and everything, but I really wanted to be in New York and I, I came back here and New York is really all about television. I mean, it's mostly television um, and it's a great place for documentary as well. Um, and so I was, I was just thinking, you know, you want to have some kind of a career path and I think um, in terms of uh, being a filmmaker and being an artist, it's often hard to have sort of a career path because you know you're going from project to project. Some things may not take off, some things might take off, but how do you work and pay your rent? And so um, I think one of the most important things that I learned, I ended up working in TV um, and had success there. I mean, not really expecting you know anything great, but um, it was a great opportunity because I was still. Um, telling stories, I was still training myself um, to tell stories, to research, um, to visually tell stories, um, to direct and edit and produce and everything. Um, and that's something that then um, inspired me to write um, the uh, feature-length screenplay, which was then at the Tribeca All Access program with the Tribeca Film Institute. So um, I was able to sort of do kind of... Um, you know, what I wanted to do, but I was still kind of paying my bills, um, having a regular day job, but that was also in, you know, in the visual arts. So um, I think one of the important things not to lose sight of as you're pursuing that three-picture deal or, you know, you want to go make it in Hollywood or, or be like the next kind of amazing independent filmmaker or whatever is that, you know, Start start building your bases now and start building your skill sets now, whether you end up working in advertising or whether you're like an assistant in TV or, or whatever it is, whether you're working on some feature films, um, doing whatever job, you know? Just sort of start building that kind of parallel resume because um, you'll always have that as a fallback in case, you know, kind of you don't hit the stars, you know? So I think, I think this panel is really important because um, you should definitely aim for... Uh, to spend as much of your time, you know, after your art, but also kind of stay grounded in terms of, you know, trying to find some kind of a career path as well. So that's um, that's what happened to me with television made me find a career path in this um, somewhat nebulous field that we're in. Sure. So I think that the reality for documentary filmmakers is that we all do something else too. So if you're Ross McElwee, you make commercials. If you're I mean, I mean uh, 
Errol Morris, you make commercials. Ross McAwee teaches. Marco Williams teaches. Sam Pollard teaches. Um, uh, Joe Berlinger, Brusinovsky make reality TV that I don't think they want to be making. And, um, <laughs> and so I think what's important, if this is really what you want to do, be a doc maker, um, the job is to be as entrepreneurial with your career as you are with your art. And I think that if we take that creativity that we um, identify with uh, in our art and apply it to our whole life, amazing things happen. I think that um, a key there, though, is that you have to know yourself. Uh, do a real inventory on yourself. Know what you'll do for money and what you won't do for money. Because sometimes when you're compromised, uh, you find yourself in rooms you don't want to be in. I remember when I was, um, so I had made a documentary on religion for HBO, and Sheila Evans, lo and behold, loved it. And so she wanted to make another documentary on religion uh, with me. <clears throat> and, and the first one was this nuanced thing about how people of different faith traditions, people who don't believe, uh, reconcile the worst that happens to them with whatever they believe. Uh, being fascinated by the fact that half the world finds faith in crisis and the other half loses faith in crisis. What's that up? What's up with that? So she said, all right, great. You're great on religion. You're perfect for HBO. Guess what? I've got another religion project for you. It's exorcism. <laughs> <laughs> of course, right? So, so I thought, okay, okay. So I, you know, I made a film, a, a smart person's film on religion for her, and she liked it. So I'll do the smart person's film on exorcism somehow. I'll crack this code. <laughs> Le Leonard Cox, my producer, is laughing in the middle of this room right now. Um, and after I showed this beautiful trailer of what we, were, we wanted to do, um, basically, Sheila said to me, look, Mackie, I don't know what you don't get. Spinning heads, projectile vomit. <laughs> that's what I want to see. So I walked from HBO downtown to my apartment and thought, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Because this is not what I'm going to do. And uh, so know what, know, know, know what works for you. Um, it, it, uh, you and what doesn't? No, I did not make that film. <laughs> I'm proud to say I didn't make that film. And then I think also, what is the DNA of your talent and your story? Because it's, everybody's is different. You know, my family business is religion. My father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather were all Presbyterian ministers. I'm named for all of them, and I'm the gay one. And so um, I'm not a Presbyterian minister, but I respect what they do. Uh, my father was a civil rights activist in Alabama where I was born, and it was really at the intersection of social change and and um, conviction, um, and so I, the, the way I now provide for my family is that I, um, I help, I'm, I, I, I work at a seminary up at Columbia to help identify the Gandhis, Kings, Dorothy Days, Heschels of today and media train them, equip them so that they can really bring it in the press, so that the people speaking for faith in America are not Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson, but are instead queer Muslims or um, in, in, uh, people who are really committed to justice. Now, when I was bartending and documentary filmmaking, did I really think that there was a career in what I just described? Of course not. But through this weird circuitous route, this is how I've uh, found my, and it's a good career. And, it's, and I love that day job activism that actually balances out my artwork. So, uh, so know what your DNA is. I am a professional interviewer. So I know wh when I'm bored in an interview, right, as a documentary filmmaker, and when I'm not. I applied that skill to tell people who are um, famous as leaders that they're boring America. And now I help them try to be less boring. And I'm also helping to find, uh, find the ones who are really built for that. The last thing I'll say in regard to this is, I remember I made a film on um, how hard it is to stay out of prison when you get out of prison for, for uh, PBS. And it was a program that was founded by formerly incarcerated people, for formerly incarcerated people. And the head of that program, Julio Medina, said, you know, it's surprising, but gang leaders make great community organizers. Think about it. Think about what they did. And I think the same goes. What do documentary filmmakers also do well in the world? Because the world needs us. The world needs artists. Thank you. Sandy, do you want to talk a little bit about 
what advice you might give filmmakers in terms of festival strategy or what to be wary of with distributors, that sort of thing, when they actually finish their films and start figuring out what to do? Um, well, a lot of what Mackie just said really resonated. Um, you know, I feel like, you know, the definition you gave about experimental, no rules. I feel like we're living in the most experimental time as filmmakers. There are no rules anymore. The industry has, you know, has been teetering, some say on collapse, some say on rebirth, the economy crash. Like, I think we're just living in this time at which this model of getting a distributor, going this certain festival route is really over. Um, so I also say be as strategic and creative in the movement of your films as you are in their making. And, you know, I almost feel like we have to be farmers right now and plant many crops. So, you know, for example, when I finished Trembling Before God, I, you know, I had, I had been kind of stunned by what happened with audiences because people were bursting into tears, throwing themselves on me. I mean, the film is about the struggle to belong, um, but through the eyes of Hasidic and Orthodox Jews who are lesbian or gay. And, you know, people were kicked out of their families, they were thrown out of religious schools, they were in marriages lying to their spouses, and I only realized in the making and release of the film that it was having profound impact on people. And I had looked to some folks who were doing politics or technology or business who are doing these speaking engagements at universities or in corporations. And I said, that's so interesting that Bill Clinton gets like $50,000 a night to speak. And I said, what is this? How does this happen? And people said, oh, we have a speaking agency. I said, wow, what is this mysterious speaking agency that just like funnels money into people's pockets? <laughs> um, so I started to ask around and basically there is this whole world of speaking agencies and they had never worked with filmmakers. So I went to one, I talked to sort of a wide range of them and said, would you be willing to take a filmmaker on? So I became this guinea pig at what's called Kepler Speakers and started to do this college university tour um, with Trembling Before God. And you know, it was a significant revenue stream. Um, and really I was doing what I loved, which was showing the film, activating community, activating audiences, activating questions and dialogue. And, you know, Kepler has since gone on to form a whole um, division dedicated to filmmakers. And they worked with, they brought on Morgan Spurlock from Super Size Me, they brought on Eugene Jarecki from Why We Fight, they brought on the director of Mad Hunt Ballroom, and they're really building that um, division. So, you know, I really think you have to be entrepreneurial to really try to figure out how to, um, again, focus on one's DNA, and I was so excited and engaged by not making another film right away, but actually investing deeply in the film that I had made and building a worldwide global movement around it. And this was a way that I could find a revenue stream to help sustain that work. So I think we really need to be creative. Rodney, and, and I believe Moon too, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, as a filmmaker and teaching as a supplemental income and how you kind of work that into your schedules? Sure. Um, yeah, you know, <laughs> what's funny is teaching for me wasn't like a very focused career path. It was actually something where I <clears throat> basically, the way that I um, was able to <laughs> afford living in New York was um, by not living in New York. And I, I say that, um, you know, comically, but I, it's really true. I would, I would spend a lot of time going to different artist colonies and different residencies and um, <clears throat> where you get free room and board, <laughs> basically. And um, I, you know, that's where I did a lot of the research and the writing for my screenplays. So places like Yaddo and McDowell, the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, Edward Albee's um, colony in Montauk on, on Long Island were all places where I would kind of squirrel away and, and do the work that I needed to do in order to, um, to write. And so uh, someone that I was there at a, a residency with just um, 
asked me if I'd ever ta thought about teaching because I would always organize these like you know evening screening events and we would have these discussions and she just got into this idea that um, she thought that I'd be a really great teacher and had asked me about it and I was I said no and she uh, recommended me for a job at Cooper Union so um, <clears throat> and that was kind of ideal because um, you know it was a one semester gig the grant money was starting to run out so it kind of came at the right time the kids were all super sophisticated and brilliant and, and I had five students and um, so you know I was sort of spoiled by that experience and and and, and you know kind of as as my work progressed and as my teaching experience at different places um, progressed, you know, it became this thing where I was, you know, really trying to balance the two and I would do like one semester teaching and then I would take a semester off and focus on my work and then, you know, I would get a big grant and I would stop teaching for a year and I'd be able to just focus on writing and and um, filmmaking and, you know, then I would go back to teaching. So that's sort of how it's been working for me in terms of the balance. And then I also feel like, you know, the work that I do with students really helps to sort of reinforce and support what I know as a filmmaker. So I feel like there's no better way to kind of um, really know what your knowledge is as a filmmaker <clears throat> than uh, teaching someone and, you know, really having to be clear about, about what you're telling them and, and really articulate about, um, about the points. So I feel like that work has really kind of fed my work as a filmmaker. And then I also feel like, you know, when you get sort of beat it up, beaten up by the film industry, it's really great to be around people that are making their first film and are still sort of in love with the magic of film. And their first role just came back from the lab and, and they're projecting <laughs> it on the wall. And they're just like, you know, just amazed. And, and I remember, you know, what that that was like, you know, just kind of being in love with the magic of film. So it's it's nice to kind of have that rekindled by students. <clears throat> On a basic level, teaching for me is great because um, it allows me um, flexibility. Um, I had to leave New York for about a month and a half, almost two months to do post-production and attend Sundance. And because of at least the situation that I created um, with the institution that I teach, at both or two institutions that I teach at, I was able to do that and not kind of completely throw my life out of whack. Um, I'm not sure I'd be able to do that with kind of a, a normal nine to five job. And so I think that's kind of important as a filmmaker is, is you know, if you're, if you're on set for, uh, you know, a week, you know, or if you're, you know, leaving town for months on end because you're pursuing projects, it's important to get, to find some kind of job that is gonna allow for that. Um, before teaching, I did audiovisual technology at Columbia Law School. And um, because of the relationship I had with my bosses, I was able to produce um, films out of the office there as well as leave for extended periods of time to go to festivals and do projects um, outside of New York, so, yeah. I think that's a really important point that uh, don't take a job where you are a closeted filmmaker I think that there are certain places that will hire you because you're a filmmaker. You know, I worked in foundations after becoming a filmmaker and that my filmmaking was an asset. And so I could always say, you know, you want me to be doing that in order to keep my networks um, alive and because that's who I am, otherwise I'm not, I'm not staying. But I, I know a producer, I just got a call this week, who, whose boss said, um, you can't work any, here anymore because your heart's not in this work because that producer is um, also a filmmaker. So, th and that is a heartbreaking situation. So really um, consider that. Again, my context now is an academic one, which again, they hired me because I'm a filmmaker and also I can leave and make, make movies uh, in the summertime. Rodney used a word called balance, and that's one of the things. I'm just going to now throw these questions open to you guys. So one of the things I would like to talk about is how you balance all your responsibilities, the, the responsible or can you, um, you know, in terms of benefits, insurance, work, freelance work. How do you 
personally keep it together or not. I could use some health insurance. <laughs> I think I have a toothache and I'm getting a little afraid of that situation. Yeah. I have to say that um, my, my biggest um, issue was that I should have health insurance no matter what, <laughs> what was happening. So, um, you know, I think, I don't know if the question is about health insurance, but they're, they're all, you know, I, I think I called the, you know, IFP and, and I said, oh, is there an insurance guy I can talk to? And they hooked me up with somebody and there is, you know, there, there, there are all these independent funds that you can actually join and you can actually have regular, well, sort of regular health insurance, basically the fund will, um, has all this money and then you can go see regular doctors and it's not like you have to go to the ER just to, you know, if you have a cold or something. So um, that's an aside on, on health insurance. Um, make sure you all have partners with regular jobs, which <laughs> is always good. Um, uh, my girlfriend has, you know, um, I want to hold her health insurance right now, but she's been on mine and back and forth. So, um, but I think um, finding that, that balance is hard because, you know, um, even though I was doing my television gig, um, which, and it was a documentary, I mean, I had a lot of control and I was writing and directing and everything. Um, in some ways, it still felt like a day job because I was going into work every day. You know, I had to be at work every day and it was sort of a, a staff position. Um, and so you have to be like, okay, well... Uh, when I was writing the screenplay for Tribeca All Access, um, you know, I was taking evening classes, um, even though I'd had screenwriting at school, but, you know, it's always nice to um, take classes, continuing ed classes or whatever, just you have that sense of community. Um, and then just, you know, uh, I had to knock out a script, and I was like, okay, I'll wake up at 5 in the morning, and, you know, between 5 and 8 or whatever, just, you know, that's my time to write. And then the rest of the day is work. And then, you know, because when you get home after work, it is it is tiring unless you're like, you know, Patricia Highsmith in her 20s where she would sort of come home from work and then take a shower and pretend it like it's a whole new day right. at, the, you know, at the end of the day and then get to writing. But, um, but you do have to try to carve out some time for yourself. And... Um, and, you know, I agree with you, um, you know, about your friend who, who they said, you know, your, your heart is not in it. I mean, I think um, as artists, if, you know, it, you do have to, if you, are, if you are pursuing another career, I mean, I think you really do have to take that seriously as well. I mean, and I think that's what's hard about balance is that you kind of have to give your career your all and you have to give your own art your all. So, um, but I do think something like teaching always offers a lot of flexibility to people, um, and I've, you know, I've since um, quit my sort of full-time job and I've been freelancing more and I found that that has been, that's given me a flexible schedule and whatever work that I do um, is always centered around my storytelling abilities. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's definitely something to be said for um, being an artist and being able to tell a story because you'll be surprised how many people can't put a narrative together in any of these fields and, or write or any of that. So. That's always an asset. I also think that different solutions work for different times in your life. So if your first love is filmmaking, be faithful to that love and then um, creative and flexible uh, in the rest of your life. Um, I, I was thinking of my trajectory over the last 15 or so years from bartending for money to freeloading for money to now working with ministers and rabbis and imams for money. <laughs> and uh, they were the right solutions at the right time, the freeloading piece. though you, It's like you never know what, um, what floor is going to suddenly fall out from beneath you, right? Like I married a TV executive guy. <laughs> And uh, then he went to school of social work. All of a sudden, you know, he came home that day and went to school of social work. And I thought, great, honey, that's great. That's a great solution for us. And now he's a stay-at-home dad. And, you know, of course, your partner has dreams, too. And um, you just have to think creatively at, at different times. I really think that um, I would love if this next era of filmmaking involved filmmakers collectively um, sort of demanding that when we seek funding for our work, that that includes 
healthcare and home investment, whether that's home buying for artists. Um, I, I think that right now the whole way that the system of money is organized is that we seek funding for our projects and completely devalue our own worth and devalue our labor and devalue our value. So I think that there is really a movement happening that, um, for example, Creative Capital Foundation, um, I really recommend looking into it. They actually have an open deadline for filmmakers, but they do these PDP, Professional Development Program Workshops, which if you can take one, go immediately because they do things like financial planning, legal clinic, strategic planning, um, and it's a, re it's a real resource. And Esther Robinson, who used to be the program officer, has written a series of articles really about this topic of this panel for Filmmaker Magazine. So I would just go onto their site and really look at sort of, because she started something called Art Home, which is about helping artists um, with the tools to buy homes. Um, so I really do think we're in this era which can really shift if we really start sticking up for, um, for how we create our lives, you know, and how we bring revenue and resource um, to our lives. And Creative Capital actually really taught me to value my labor and time and put a number on it and to build that into the budget. You know, if I'm going to release my film, that means that I am potentially going to spend one to three years in taking that film around the world and generating revenue and generating change. Well, I should be paid during that time. Um, we should all be paid during that time when we go to festivals, you know? And we, and we are exploring this new frontier of distribution opportunities. So like we have the power, let's seize it and let's really create the next revenue generating models for ourselves. One other tip that's useful to me um, for documentary filmmakers is don't expect to make money on the back end of your project. I, I, you've probably heard this before, but if not, this is really, um, this is really helpful to me. Build yourself into your grants, pay yourself now, not later. And I think that that's the key to balance in my experience too. Uh, don't postpone balance, even though it's sort of an inside joke that nobody balances is a myth, uh, whether it's health or um, resources. I think that, that if you, it's really easy to burn out and, and then just leave your, um, your art behind. And that's the real tragedy. It's how do you sustain that? And again, as a doc maker, it's paying yourself as the money comes in. I would like to talk a little further on grants because I think you can offer your trials and tribulations and how do you get through that application process, how, what sort of resources are available for people that want to learn how to um, you know, work on grant proposals, et cetera, in, in our creative arena. Well, I definitely think that the, a key for, f um, a key for any success is network like crazy. Call people. If there's, if you're applying, <laughs> somebody's calling now. <laughs> Answer that. Um, I, I mean, I was a foundation officer and ran a little documentary, um, a foundation that gave grants to documentary filmmakers, and remain on that board. And it's the filmmaker's job, it's the television executive's job to know you and to know your work. Uh, it's basically talent scouting, in a sense, story scouting. So, but, I, but there's a thing about power in this, it, when it comes to money, that we feel um, we, 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 we are um, less proactive than we ought to be and are intimidated when, in fact, those foundations and television um, executives exist uh, for, for our work. And so, so that's one thing. And then for those who have gone, uh, who are doing well, network with them. I think that uh, network with, with any of us who have come up with solutions that are appealing to you and that you want to figure out. And I think for those of us, like the, the artist's house thing, for those of us who have figured out, who are carving out places where people like us can work for pay, um, there's often room for more. So you should, we should all be um, working in this together. 
So, you know, I was just going to say that, um, <clears throat> you know, for me, what was interesting is that, um, you know, I went to Brown as an undergrad and, and started making films there. And, you know, the interesting thing about that program was that they didn't allow you to touch a camera until you had been thoroughly versed in semiotics and film theory and feminist theory and Marxist theory. And it was a very theory-based program. And um, at the time, it drove me completely nuts. But I have to say that, um, you know, being that well versed in kind of understanding the cultural impact of what I was doing directly fed into my grant writing and my ability to actually articulate, um, you know, what I thought my films were doing and what kind of impact I wanted them to have. So those things sort of, I think, went hand in hand. And I think another thing, you know, with the grant writing process is, you know, A, have um, filmmaker friends of yours read your proposals before you send them in. Um, another thing that I often do is, um, you know, ask filmmaker friends of mine who have actually gotten grants from this organization that I'm applying to to let me see their application. And just so I have an idea of, you know, what a successful application looks like, how it was laid out, how they articulated it, whether or not they were using academic semiotic jargon or whether it was plain spoken and just kind of, um, you know, very down to earth. So, you know, and I think that also just each institution or, or foundation or whatever it is that you're applying to, you know, has a specific niche that they're trying to fulfill. So I think really kind of gearing it to the specific organization, understanding what type of artists they're looking to fund and support. Like, you know, a place like Creative Capital is looking for non-traditional narratives. So I would actually, you know, underline and delineate what was non-traditional or different about the approach that I was doing to Daydream. And, you know, so it, it really is about sort of gearing it to the mandate of a specific organization, I think, as well. <clears throat> Um, I actually uh, educated myself um, in relation to grant writing at the Queens Council of the Arts. I think each of the councils of the arts in the boroughs, I think Brooklyn, Queens, Bronx Council of the Arts, they all have grant writing basics uh, classes that are free. So that was my first step in trying to uh, learn how to get grants. Um, how do you identify the message for all these different foundations? Is that from seeing what they funded or is that what you've from talking to your friends or? I mean, it's a combination of all of those things, but I think, you know, most foundations, if, if you look at places like CineReach or Creative Capital, they will be very clear about the type of artists that they're looking to fund, you know? So it's, it's really, you know, kind of understanding, A, what they have funded in the past and, and how your work may or may not fit in with what they're looking for. So sometimes it's just a waste of time, you know what I mean? It's like your work will never be what they're looking for and you can't, no matter how much you try to sort of pitch it or, you know, make it into something that it's not, ultimately you have to know that it's not what they're looking for and that, you know, that, that it's wasted energy. But I also think that there are organizations um, that you can discover that or, you know, there's a specific aspect of your, your piece that, you know, can be brought out. A lot of times it, it is the things that you highlight, you know, that, that um, helps them to see how your your piece can fit in, like a place like independent television service. You know what I mean? It's there's very specific things that I would talk about in terms of the diversity of America, the PBS audience, ways of reaching you know that audience in a, in a proposal to them that I wouldn't necessarily feel the need to put in a proposal to a place like Creative Capital. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I think that most foundations are pretty clear about you know outlining and delineating what they're looking to support. And I think also just be generous. You know, I think um, thanking people mm -hmm. um, on screen, at screenings, thanking foundations, sending a DVD, giving tickets to the premiere, um, really be very conscious of the relationship that you're building for life. Um, I really want to build a lifelong relationship with my funders whether they be foundations or donors, and really want to carry them over time from project to project. And I think part of it is that you're, you're not just, you're giving donors or foundations value. You're actually giving to them by them funding you. 
So it's not just that we're coming as filmmakers with our little begging bowl and saying, please, you know, we're on the ground and they're bequeathing us. I really do think that this is a partnership um, and to approach it as a partnership um, with that dignity. Um, and, you know, for example, I met this funder and she was really looking to put her money with meaning in the world. And, you know, she funded the completion, she funded a piece of the completion of Trembling Before God. And then I said, well, actually, I'd really like to do this whole Orthodox education project. And she saw the impact the film was having and put some money into that. And I said then, you know, a year later, you know, there's parts of the world we can't reach. And it's really critical for us to reach, you know, places where there are Jewish communities um, that don't have this dialogue, like the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. And she gave me a grant for that. And then she came on board the next project, which was a Jihad for Love, and gave us production money. So this was an example of someone, you know, who I really built like years of connection with because it was relationship building, which we do in our lives all the time. And just bring it to your work as well. And for those of you, you, you most of you probably know this, but the Foundation Library is right up the street on Fifth Avenue, and you can, the Foundation Center, and you can Google them. You can use their library for free. It is open for free to the public. And you can research any number of parameters to locate grants that might be appropriate for you in your project. Because I agree with the panelists, part of your responsibility is doing the legwork and the research to understand how your film fits in in the universe so that you don't waste enormous emotional and physical energy on something that's not going to come to fruition. Um, Moon mentioned earlier about his uh, screening at Sundance allowed him to get an agent. And if any of y the others of you have agents or representation, Perhaps you could talk a little bit about how that journey came to pass and what you might advise filmmakers to have in their back pocket if they're looking for representation. Um, I don't know about back pocket um, as far as looking for representation. I think um, I have friends who've, who've actively searched for representation. It doesn't quite work for them. I don't know if that's a, a rule, but... Um, I think that, um, um, well, if you're looking for an agent, for what, do you, what should you have written? What do you need to have, if you're going to approach an agent and, and not just say, hi, I'm a filmmaker, but what do you need to know about yourself and about what you want to do in order to approach an agent? Well, I mean, I think, I don't know if, if, if the same is, for, is Mo if Moon's experience is the same, but for me, like, I never went out looking for an agent. I kind of let my work circulate, and and an agent or a manager actually came to me and, and was interested in representing me. And you know, and I have to say, like, it, it was a bit of a mixed bag. Like, it wasn't, and I and I, I wasn't quite clear if it was the right fit. If we kind of fit in terms of um, the kinds of connections that he had and the kinds of work that he was presenting to me and the stuff that I was interested in. So, and ultimately, you know, we decided to go our separate ways because it just wasn't a very fruitful partnership. So I think also it's, you know, whether or not they understand what your passion is as a filmmaker, the kinds of projects that you want to be involved in, um, and, you know, also how that can feed into kind of forging a career path. But I also think that, that that ultimate kind of fit has to work and that if it doesn't, it, it, you know, it, it can definitely be a mixed bag because on, on one level you think that, A, you have representation, so they're sort of out there kicking down the doors, but then, you know, they have 30 to 40 clients or whatever that they're working for, so... You know, so you feel like you can pull back a little bit if if someone is representing you and kind of going out there and selling your your projects. So for me, you know, I feel like that was detrimental. You know, to actually give that power to someone else to actually represent me, and and so for me, it, it, I actually feel like it was more beneficial to represent myself and to pick up the phone myself and to actually engage with people in terms of the projects that they were thinking about me for. And, um, you know, so 
I don't know. I, I think it's, it's a very tricky dynamic and relationship. I would say I, I don't have an agent or a manager, but um, friends that do have often said that even if you do have an agent or manager, the legwork is still really up to you. You know, they're just in to sort of swoop in in the last minute and take your, you know, 10% or 20% and, <laughs> and sort of go with that. But, I mean, often I think um, Sandy's point about networking, you know, I mean, just earlier this month I had a meeting with the president of Food Network to pitch my um, food and travel show that I shot last year. And it's like I didn't have an agent or manager who got me that meeting. It's, you know... My, my producing partner knew someone who sat on a board with somebody who, you know, and that's actually the beauty of New York City is that you really have access to so many people in so many ways. You know, somebody you know will know someone who can help you with, you know, your project. So, I mean, I think networking is really the most important part of it. I mean, agents and managers come in in, in terms of, like, the deal making. You know, that's what's key, you know, because they really know how to, work for their 10% when it comes down to that. But. <laughs> well, actually, for me, my manager actually sets up meetings for me. I'm not the best networker in the world. So uh, for me, a manager works really well in terms of getting meetings that I wouldn't normally be able to kind of um, get myself. Um, the agent is there, like like Poo Poo said, um, to kind of swoop down and take 10% when there's a deal that needs to be brokered. So um, yeah, I think those are kind of the, 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 that's the kind of the standard differentiation between the two. Um, but I think, yeah, more and more, I feel like I'm agreeing with Rodney that um, as far as like independent film, if you have kind of an independent sensibility, that um, the, the kind of Hollywood manager agent thing can be kind of a, a strange fit sometimes because there are projects that they'll send to you that just don't make sense um, in relation to who you are, who you have established yourself as a filmmaker, uh, as, as a filmmaker. Um, and so you can kind of just spin your wheels with all these kind of crazy projects that come in that you absolutely do not want to do. Um, so yeah, it can be a mixed bag, definitely. How have you used the internet and social networking to create a fan base or involve your um, collaborators? Or how has it helped? Has it hurt? How do you use it? I used Kickstarter to raise $10,000 for my last short film. Kickstarter.com. Kickstarter. Every time I did a screening, I would put out a piece of paper in the audience and ask people for their email addresses and literally was doing this from, I guess, the late 90s and built up a database of like 25,000 people um, because I was doing intensive live touring. and. Um, that has generated, I mean, that's migrated to Facebook and Twitter, and, and so really feel like I am in communication regularly with people who've been super supportive, and it's led to all kinds of amazing opportunities, um, including even um, apartments. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because, well, I'll just throw it out there. I'm looking for a sublet starting March 8th. <laughs> So if you know a Give Brooklyn sublet, address. March 8th, come talk to me. Um, but yeah, really seize the moment, right? Seize the opportunity, uh, whether whatever medium it exists in, whether that's you know Twitter, Facebook, or live, in-person, face-to-face interaction. Um, I think it's important to always remember, too, that filmmakers, um, that we work in community and collaborations, and, and often we work with producers and associate producers and outreach directors and, and interns, it's important to know just as you seek other work um, in the film work itself, what are, you, what are you good at and what are you not good at? So when you were talking about your manager sets up meetings for you that you wouldn't otherwise do, um, in, in documentary, uh, you know, it's all about community engagement now, Sandy being a real um, a maestro and teacher in this regard. And uh, so you might not have that database, but the national uh, organization with whom you're working may. So I think that it's a critical component, but you don't have to invent every piece of it. Mm -hmm. You just need to think in, in regard to it. And I, I will, I'll throw out this because, Sandy, because it's amazing. I just did the Bay Area Video Co Coalition Producers Institute with art. I'm making a documentary now, a feature doc, on the first gay bishop in Christendom, who I met on my day job, right? Uh, which is interesting, too, that sometimes your, your, your off-hours work 
will, gener will, 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 will give you stories you never ever would have found otherwise. So it can be a good thing in all kinds of mysterious ways. Anyway, I'm making this film about this, this, this guy and the way in which he single-handedly has shifted um, church and state politics at home and abroad. And um, so we workshopped our film at the Bay Area Video Coalition to, to create a mobile web application um, that goes along with our film that has its own life in terms of um, working toward LGBT equality. And, and I think that obviously, as media makers now, we need to think transmedia, we need to think cross-platform, we need to recognize that there are many little shorts in our feature films and many different applications. And if you do all that thinking, right, with partners, then just like having a database of 25,000, you have much greater assets for HBO or PBS or whoever might be interested in investing in you. You're bringing constituency that they need and then can keep. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, I would concur with that. And, you know, I think that, um, <clears throat> you know, with the changing landscape of film and specifically distribution, I think that um, that's basically what I'm using social media platforms for is, you know, getting the word out about screenings, having, you know, a thousand people that are, you know, fans of a short film that I made that and every time it screens in New York, I you know, press a button and it goes out to a thousand people about, you know, information about screening. So I feel like, um, you know, it is becoming more and more um, the filmmaker's job to be savvy about distribution, to be very, very clear about who their audience is and how to reach them, you know what I mean? So if you bring that kind of information to a distributor, um, you already have a leg up in terms of getting your film out there. And, and if you're doing it yourself, which m more and more people are opting to do, then it, you know, it becomes that much easier when you're having screenings to get the word out. And, and in terms of booking theaters, et cetera, you know, you know you will have the information going out to that many more people when it's time to actually fill the seats on opening weekend, and, and which can determine whether your film is playing for one week or six months. You know? So I think that all of those kinds of social media platforms are, are you know, becoming more and more important. Can I just ask, actually, can you describe a little bit about your, your Kickstarter campaign? <laughs> because I do think it is revolutionizing yeah. how we're making our work and actually also getting the startup money or the, you know, the, the kind of initial push from our circles. And so I think it'd be really valuable because it's, it's... Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't uh, explain that in the first place. Um, Kickstarter.com um, and Indiegogo are both crowdsourcing uh, models for uh, funding art projects. Um, it's films, all kinds of things, sculpture, um, all kinds of things. Um, uh, and Indiegogo. Indiegogo and... I-N-D-I-E-G-O-G-O. -G -O. Right. Um, Kickstarter, K-I... Yep. C K S T A R T R. Um, and <laughs> basically, uh, how do I explain this? They they both kind of they 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 mobilize your social network to basically um, donate small amounts of money to you. Um, and so, if you have a social network of twenty five thousand people, if each of them gives like a couple bucks in exchange for you know little small uh, incentives like prizes or gifts or whatever, based on what you're raising money for, um, you have like twenty five thousand you know dollars right there. Um, so it's actually been really uh, successful, I think, um, lately, especially Kickstarter. Um, Kickstarter has a really, a really nice kind of um, interface, so people trust it, and it's, um, yeah, it's, it's been really effective. I didn't really believe in crowdsourcing at first, and um, I saw some of my friends raise money for various projects, and then I did it, and it worked. And how did you decide to set your goal on Kickstarter? Um, it was kind of an arbitrary uh, number, I think. I think I kind of evaluated, for me, what my, how large my social network was, um, and then decided that actually it was, I decided to go for 8,000, and then somehow was able to raise uh, over 10,000. Um, but if you have a really huge social network that, if you've been out there and like on Facebook or Twitter for a while, people know who you are and know the work that you're doing and kind of like that work, then you might be able to set your, your goal higher. Um, but the great thing about India, go, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. The great thing about Kickstarter is that Kickstarter makes it so that you have to reach your goal in order to draw the money out. So it kind of um, creates even more incentive for people to give you money um, because they want you to reach that goal. The closer you get, I think it more it incentivizes people to give you um, donations. 
And did you, um, did you have to, in, because from what I've heard, the best campaigns, you have to sort of spend a month sort of promoting it and, and building it and really sort of devote it. It's not just sort of put it on and it, the money just comes, right. but you really have to sort of build it. And True. Did, you, did you do that? Yeah, I did. I built, um, I built a little page and it had um, kind of a, a hierarchy of, of donations and, and prizes. Um, also, it had a trailer. Uh, people do various things. Usually, there's a, a, um, a, a video component, either a trailer or just kind of a presentation. If you're not a filmmaker, it could be a presentation based on the food truck you want to start in Athens, Georgia, or something like that. So, um, yeah, there definitely is a page that you kind of build and continue to build um, as your Kickstarter campaign goes on. Um, and there's various time, I guess, um, time, lengths of time that you can kind of create, I guess. Uh, to, to raise money, you can you can try to raise money for a month or two months or depending on what right. time you have. Yeah. The, the difference at the moment is that Kickstarter is only available for the United States uh -huh. and Indiegogo is global. So if you're a filmmaker based in the UK, you can't really use Kickstarter, but you can use Indiegogo. Also, so. I think uh, Kickstarter is not a 501c3. It's not a... Uh, 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 a nonprofit, so you don't, you're not able to actually officially uh, have your uh, donors uh, write it off on their taxes, but Indiegogo is, I think. Right. Can I just ask how many of you have done a crowdfunding campaign? Uh, and how many of you have used Kickstarter? And how many used Indiegogo? Okay. How many didn't know about it? I've never heard of it. Okay, so I was preaching to convert it. Okay. <laughs> Um, let's talk a little bit about who advises you, and this in, from a practical perspective. Like, do you have an attorney? Do you do your own taxes? Are there organizations that you're a member of that help you kind of sort this kind of stuff out? I won't call the IRS. Don't worry. <laughs> One of my favorite things that's been said tonight. Sandy said, and it's a relation, it's about the power of relationship and the importance of every single relationship. What, you know, when you screw somebody over, it comes back and bites you, right? And the, and the opposite is true also. Um, in terms of Kickstarter, I was sending out funder updates to people who I had never met before who had donated online but who didn't leave me their email list. So I, I was Googling them and trying to find their email and I sent them an email. And the next day I was in a meeting at Creating Change and I looked over at the person's name tag and it was the donor. It was the person who had given me 150 bucks for my film. And we fell into a conversation and now she's really interested in continuing to give. I just really want to focus on that relationship thing, which also leads me to the point that I love my lawyer so much I could die. Um, <laughs> we get haircuts together at the local $12 barber, and uh, he's been my lawyer since 1996. And uh, I think that when the relationship doesn't work, when the person is just trying to take something from you, you got to get out and get out fast. And um, another thing about empowerment is, you know, Check people's references ahead mm -hmm. of time, right? A distributor's, a manager's, really find out whether or not this is somebody you want to get into business with. And regardless of how desperate the moment is, please don't act out of desperation. Anyway, I have a lawyer. Uh, he worked pro bono for me for the first film. And then I've given him so much work, just like my therapist. I've given her so much work that <laughs> it's OK that I don't pay her or him. Um, and now, now I'm able to pay him. And I think that uh, that's worked out well. Same with a, an accountant. I found a great accountant through uh, the filmmaker. I was an editor before I was a director. Um, uh, so one of the directors for whom I worked uh, gave me an accountant. And she is, she's, she's, she's like a mother to me. These relationships really, um, and they are, they can, they can stretch the dollar. So again, these alliances are critical. I, ac I actually met Sandy um, at his lawyer's office, <laughs> at, a, at a Christmas party at his lawyer's <laughs> office. <laughs> and um, I have an entertainment lawyer there at the same law firm. But um, yeah, but, but you know, she's also a friend. Right. She's also a friend, so... Um, She's actually my girlfriend's friend. So, <laughs> so it, it helps to like know the person because they do have... I mean, lawyers will have your best interest at heart. They should anyway. I think they swear to that. But, um, but it is good to, you know, 
have somebody looking out for you because there are going to be all these contracts and everything. I mean, any relationship you get into, even just um, with my producing partner that I did this sort of food show with, you know, um, you just should have a contract, even if you're friends or whatever. Um, sometimes you don't need it, but sometimes it's good to have. Um, you don't want to do overkill with the contracts either, but it's always good to have um, someone there that can look over releases and all of that stuff that you need for production. And um, yeah, I, I can't stress enough that they should be, you know, your friends and, and working for you too. I think too that, um, I mean, besides Laura Accountant, I mean, we're these the way that we make our work is so um, like there's there's no easy structures. I mean, we sort of have to create the structures that that move our work, and sometimes there's conflict. Um, and I had a quite a challenging relationship with someone that I worked on a project with, and and I found that there's actually people called work coaches. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually went to this work coach together to try to really work out how to be director, producer together. And, um, and it, it actually worked. Um, <laughs> so I do think that there's also people out there who can help one really think more long term also do contracts. I mean, we need our lawyers do and accountants, contracts. but also that strategic planning, strategic visioning, um, the dealing with all of the, the complexity of, of being a filmmaker and working in, com in community. Um, so I, you know, if anyone is in a conflictual situation, you need a recommendation of a work coach, I will give you one. <laughs> I was just gonna talk a little bit about um, just other filmmakers as, as mentors or advisors or people who have gone through a, a certain process that you haven't gone through, I think, for me, have been kind of the most um, important mentors to me. Like, w one person that comes to mind is a filmmaker named Jim McKay, who I actually met at Sundance when I was in film school, and, um, you know, I didn't know him at all, but he had cast someone an actress that I knew in his first film, Girls Town, and I just went up to him and, you know, was basically like, your film is amazing and you are so smart for casting Anjanou Ellis because she's a genius. And, like, you know, so it, it already had started with this kind of mutual interest in each other's work. And, and you know, subsequently, I worked as an assistant editor when I got out of film school and would always sort of find myself in the same room with Jim McKay because we were interested in the same topics and the same films that were being made. And then ultimately he actually became the producer of Brother to Brother and you know was really very, very um, <clears throat> ger generous in terms of sharing that kind of knowledge. So I, I do think that most filmmakers um, are very generous in terms of sharing knowledge that they've accrued over the years and that that you know, other filmmakers can be the most valuable resource in terms of advice and opinions and because, you know, they've kind of been down that road before. Yeah, people tend to think that other filmmakers are my enemy. I'm competing against right. them all the time, but they mm -hmm. can be your best allies and create community for you. Um, I'm going to ask them one more question and then we'll open it up to questions from you. So... So my, my final question is for you guys to really address anything that you want to share about, about being a filmmaker, about, you know, especially we have a great component of new filmmakers out there and aspiring filmmakers and what maybe you could share about your experience with them that might help them not be so scared. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Think first. laughs> Well, I'll, I'll say, you know, um, you're, you're probably trained to think of certain things as the opportunities, but the opportunities are everywhere. You know, you never know what you decide to take on or who you decide to partner with that might actually be your big break, and it may not be getting the agent or the manager. So um, I think keep a very open mind to... Um, whatever comes at you in terms of opportunities. And, and um, as much as you can, as you said, sowing many seeds, do as many different things at one time as you can and something will go. You know, you know I, I think for me, the big thing is just um, passion about what I'm doing and about the story that I'm trying to tell and having 
you know, that passion sort of give me the will to kind of kick down the doors and overcome all of the obstacles that, um, that, that you face. And I just feel like at the end of the day, like that's the thing that kind of gets me over those hurdles. Like a, like a real kind of strong, driving, blinding, fierce passion for the story that you're telling. And then if you don't have that, you, you know, you shouldn't have to try to convince yourself that it's there. Like it just needs to be there. And, and so for me, like th that's really kind of the most important element in terms of, um, you know, sustaining yourself and, and kind of dealing with all of the obstacles that you face. I, I am a real optimist when it comes to uh, living a full life as an artist. And I know that bucks the message that we get often in our families and in our current economic moment and system. But uh, have a, I, I love being evidence that, uh, that one can be so happy uh, at 45, after 15 or 20 years as a filmmaker, uh, not, again, not looking like I imagined, not my life not looking as I imagined it would, but so much more interesting and rich. Uh, you know, I think that the old cliche, I, I totally go with the passion bit, uh, of you, we, we must, we must um, apply our deepest bliss to the world's greatest need, you know that line? I think that that if you stay true to that, we are not just filmmakers. You know, I've learned that I am a father, and boy, is there bliss. There's also, you know, murderous rage, but there's bliss. <laughs> and same with filmmaking. But um, but so so if so if I have those two identities, where are the other places where I can be totally fulfilled and passionate? And what I am learning in life, and I, I, I always critique myself, is this a place, do I say this because uh, I inherit it with privilege, or what, what is it? But, but I feel like there's something about being true to the self, and I've seen it from all quarters, um, that leads to fulfillment. It shouldn't be a su surprise, and I know people struggle um, who ought not to, but that's the greatest advice. And so when your stomach is in knots because you're doing the, you, you're, you're, you've got the opportunity that everybody would die for, but you know it's just not right for you, Sheila and Evan saying, you know, come on, make the film on exorcism, come on, it'll be great. <laughs> spin right, spin that. Walk out of the room and find the thing that truly is great for you. Um, I have just a real simple thing, which is, I have this mantra I say to my myself, which is step humble to the craft, which basically just means respect filmmaking as a really difficult endeavor that um, you'll be educating yourself about for the rest of your life. And I feel like I meet too many people who think that um, they can just, um, because they have that much money, they can just throw hundreds of thousands of dollars at a project and um, it'll come out really great. And um, they have no, no sense that they should even maybe try to understand how stories work, or maybe read a book on directing, or maybe watch a film by someone else. They just think it's just not necessary because they have the money. So I say, don't be that guy. <laughs> I think it's, um, you know, I was just, it was interesting just watching what was happening in Egypt, um, you know, in the past two weeks, because one of the main people in Jihad for Love was an Egyptian named Mazen, who was in prison. Um, and he was targeted because he was gay and arrested and tortured and, and raped in prison and um, had to flee and got out and got asylum in France. And, you know, sometimes, I, you know, when it's tough, I just really think of the people who are at the center of the films that I'm making. And it's really about doing justice to their lives and amplifying their voice and being some kind of messenger um, for people, for issues. So that's really what sort of gets me, gets me going um, every day. Um, I do think also that, um, you know, there are evangelists out there that I turn to, um, people like Peter Broderick, who really champion filmmakers and champion new ways of being filmmakers. Um, so I also encourage people to go towards the light, um, go towards the the Peter Brodericks, go to peterbroderick.com and, and look at, you know, really his, 
the way that he sort of shines on people who are doing things in really creative ways and just be inspired by that. Well, I, I said do as many things as you can and one thing will go. So, <laughs> All right, let's, um, let's take questions from you guys. Yes. Hi. Um, you mentioned that you were looking to sublet a place. I was wondering if you would consider Hoboken. <laughs> We'll talk afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I was just curious if um, <clears throat> each of you, uh, since you know editing and shooting is so uh, accessible right now, how much of that do you take on, whether it's editing or shooting? I actually, um, I do a lot of editing. Um, I'm, I'm. I'm moving away from that and doing more sort of the uh, storytelling and concept development part of things, but um, that is a great skill to have. I mean, editing will pay your rent. You know, you can you know, if you have that skill, you can get so many jobs. And these days, they're looking for producer editors, director editors. I mean, they want you to be able to do everything. So um, I also find that um, I've worked with editors before too, but I also find um, uh, you know it. Uh, it's just nice to be able to edit the project that you're doing because as an editor, you're already thinking of how you're going to be putting it together. So it does make the whole process really efficient. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it's do as much editing as you can because um, in terms of paying yourself, you know, on, on that list, on the budget, I mean, it's great for that too. So, yeah. If I could just have an addendum, I, I'm actually an editor and I, I'm coming, you know, doing it for about 10 years and I kind of have a love-hate relationship with it. So... Do you, I guess if you just comment too about uh, liking working with an editor or doing it yourself or, you know, where you guys fall on that spectrum? I would just say that I uh, have a similar experience and background to Boo Boo in that I did come up through editing and was an assistant editor and um, <clears throat> worked as an editor for years before um, directing my first feature. And what, what's interesting is that the editor that I ended up working with was someone who I assisted for a couple of features and then she basically had asked me, you know, what I was working on and asked to read the screenplay and, and you know, read it and really liked it and said she would love to edit it. So that was a really um, <clears throat> incredibly valuable relationship that proved to me that there didn't need to be this kind of heart hierarchy in terms of, you know, whether you're the assistant or whether you're the director, it's all about, you know, the ideas and, and the film that you're making and sort of you know, making sure the best ideas kind of come to the foreground. And for me, it's been really important to not edit the pieces that I direct. So for me, having, um, you know, this editor that's a partner who I really trust, who comes to the material with a very fresh, objective eye, who doesn't know that it was a 17-hour shoot day and that, you know, the loudspeaker in the subway was going off like every two minutes and the actors were about to kill me. And, you know, basically it's just the scene doesn't work and it does what, what it gives the information that we got two scenes ago and it needs to go. And, and that's it, you know what I mean? So for me, like, the clarity that comes from an objective editor that is only kind of judging what's on screen, that has no information about the backstory, about what happened, or any of the drama with the crew or the actors or anything, it has been really vital. Yeah, even if you are an editor, I think it's important to have someone to tag team with you or partner with you, just to like give you perspective if you've also been the person, if you were also the person that shot the film, just like Rodney said. Hi. Um, you know, filmmakers are a dime a dozen, it seems, these days with technology being as available as it is. And I wondered when you, you know, are shooting your film and putting it into a film festival, especially for a first time, or how much are you concerned about uh, the entertainment aspect versus the artistic aspect? And how much is it? I know there has to be a balance, but which one seems to, to weigh heavier? in that balance? <laughs> Not easy. I right? think the different filmmakers um, are, are different. <laughs> and uh, I, I think that there are some who 
make very conventional films and they're just masterful storytellers. They're really great at crafting story and character that will um, uh, register with um, a broad audience. Um, and if that's you, then great, go for that. Uh, if, but if it's a um, particular um, artistic vision that is what makes you love the work, I think that's an extraordinary asset that you should never, ever, ever betray. And again, it can be soul crushing to do that uh, because somebody's telling you to or because you think it'll, it'll, uh, it'll benefit you in some other way. Uh, so I think it's just about uh, being true to yourself. But I always think and I, and I say to the room, too, you know, you are the ones we are waiting for, right? You are the next voices or the now voices. And recognize, be true to that vision, that voice now, because uh, often it's, it's at its uh, most potent um, right off the bat. And as you have kids and are working another job, it's, you, you, it's, it's, it's just important to have ways to access um, your particular voice and the way you, uh, your particular lens on life. Um, that's my two cents. I mean, I, I feel like you are you that makes, you are the ones that makes your uh, particular film unique. But um, at the end of the day, though, it is entertainment. So um, we shouldn't lose sight of that. Hi. I don't, do you really need the microphone? I guess yes. so. <laughs> Hi, I'm Marina Lutz. I'm a filmmaker. I have two questions for you. I'm getting ready to launch a Kickstarter campaign, and I also happen to have fiscal sponsorship, and it's been suggested to me that I hook my fiscal sponsorship account up to my Kickstarter campaign, and I'm wondering if any of you have any experience with that or know anyone who's done that or have an opinion about me doing that. No. It'd be great if you could. Yeah. It would just help, you know, in terms of getting people to, to donate. And you I think, don't know if it's possible. I, I don't know anyone that's yeah, actually Yeah, no, it, I asked them already, it and is. they said it is. You should definitely I, I'm do waiting that. for my fiscal sponsor to get back to me and tell me they. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, okay. Um, as far as kick, uh, Kickstarter, did you run it for 30 days, 60 days, 45 days? I think I ran mine for 60 days. I wanted to go longer, but I just didn't have time uh, in relation to my production schedule. Okay, so. okay. And... Can I ask one other question? Um, I need a lawyer that speaks French and English and knows <laughs> French and, and American entertainment law and will work pro bono. Where do you suggest I find that? So my lawyer's name is Jamie Wolf, J-A-I-M-E. And um, he speaks French? I don't know. Ask him. Okay. His, his email is jwolf at p-w-e-s dot com, I think. You can also try um, you. volunteer lawyers for the arts. Yes, I know about them. Okay. And you know they know one another. So if Jamie doesn't isn't the right guy for you, he'll probably have a suggestion. Thank you. Hi. Good night. My name is Omar Derby. I, I am a, a filmmaker. I currently co-wrote a screenplay, and um, I'm working with the producer. We're trying to get a couple of SAG actresses as the lead. Uh, we have about 10% of the budget already. What we're thinking, what we're hoping to do is get a cup, uh, generate some interest from these actresses and use that as leverage to try to promote for funding. Does that work? Rodney? Uh, <laughs> yes, I mean, to <clears throat> it can work. I shouldn't say that it always works, but you know, I do think that that's kind of a, a very, um, standard route to go in terms of financing, you know, attaching talent before the financing is in place. And, and, a, and a, in a lot of ways, I think that that is expected of narrative filmmakers these days to actually have producers and casting directors send the scripts out to established actors and actresses and, you know, have them be as passionate about the story and the material as you are and um, thus that, that sort of validates the project and I think in a lot of funders' eyes. So, um, <clears throat> but you know, it's, it's the same thing that, that we're talking about in terms of any kind of relationship. They should 
again, be as passionate as you are about it and, and be excited to play it. And, and it has to be um, a real collaboration where, where you're both working towards the same, the same movie. So I think that, that that can work, but it's not the only way to do it. Hi. Um, for someone that works in television and started in television but wants to transition into documentary filmmaking, mm -hmm. what would be the best way that they could start into that? Or, you know, kind of like entry level or, you know, if there are skills that could translate? So I have two suggestions. One is um, identify your favorite documentary filmmaker, call them up and work with them. And I think the mentoring uh, uh, I think mentorship is critical, and we all should have mentors at all points in our lives. So um, find one. And secondly, I would say that uh, uh, spend a lot of time uh, thinking about the story you're dying to tell. And if, it's, and if it's that critical to you, chances are it is going to speak powerfully to others. And... Um, when I was making my first film, I thought chances, having edited a lot, chances are nobody will ever see this film. It'll probably take three years to make, and they might as well be good, three good years from me, you know what I mean? Because who knows what the person, whether the film will ever see the light of day. And I would invest that kind of time. What do you want to be doing anyway? What story do you want to tell? Who do you care about so much? Whose voice is that worthwhile that you want to project it and give your life to it? But, but boy, do you have assets, right, coming from television. You know a lot. So you've got a lot to leverage there. I also think that um, besides sort of contacting filmmakers who you really, who you admire, um, maybe. Then go to people who are more independent, who yeah. who are. <laughs> Who would love people who would come in, yeah. you know, two days a week, three days a week, a few hours at a time. I think most filmmakers, documentary filmmakers documentary especially, filmmakers. would love that. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, oh, yeah, totally. I, I, unpaid or stipend, I mean, it's also a question of what you're able to do. But I also think go, you know, go to institutions and festivals as well to potentially volunteer, um, whether that be Tribeca. Institute or IFP, Film Week, Independent Film Week, or where you can actually swim in the waters of documentary and swim in the community. And sometimes I've had my best conversations where there's someone who's volunteered for a film festival and they're actually, you know, they're tasked to coordinate an event or drive someone around and you actually have this time in the car or time where you can actually just talk to each other. Um, sometimes going to festivals that are not sort of, um, like let's say going to a festival which it might be a little bit smaller, not let's say Sundance, but maybe Woodstock um, or Hamptons Film Fest or festivals that are nearby New York where, where it's more intimate and there's more opportunity to really meet people um, and really bond with them. Like I've had, like I was at the Thessaloniki Documentary Film Festival in Greece with Jihad for Love and they would organize these excursions to like Alexander the Great's you know, father's tomb. And I wound up sitting on the bus with the commissioning editor from this you know, German TV station and this festival programmer. And it was in Thessaloniki that you actually had much more access um, to people in key positions rather than at a Berlin or a Sundance or sometimes Tribeca, which can be a little bit overwhelming. And also, especially for documentaries, you know, Silver Docks is in Silver Springs in the beginning of June. And you can volunteer for that festival. And if you do volunteer for a festival, though, think wisely. A lot of volunteers immediately go for the big glamorous stuff, and that's not going to help your career. So if you really want to, um, you know, establish a career or make a transition and volunteer for a festival, Think about what area is the best for you. Well, that would be the filmmaker area, so you can meet all the filmmakers. That would be the programming area, so you can meet all the programmers. So that you understand what goes into the process as opposed to just looking for the, you know, the big um, opening night job. So those doc, especially there are some doc-only film festivals that are absolutely wonderful, and I know Silver Doc specifically looks for volunteers, and they have a volunteer application on their website. And it's you can even, if you don't have the time to volunteer, they offer special student passes. You can just go down for the day. So that, for that arena, that may be a good option for you, too. 
One other suggestion. What, what, um, what, eight, what the folks at HBO have always said and said to me is that the critical asset someone has who's going to get programmed there is access. So think about who you have or what you have access to that nobody else does um, because, and then shoot. And if you can you know, put a reel together, uh, who cares this, that you're a first time filmmaker? Sometimes um, these companies will prefer that because they feel like they can, they can drive the car or drive the show and then you just need a good contract. But, um, but go ahead, once you've got that reel, same with foundations, if you've got the goods, then, then you're off and running. Uh, oh, thanks. Um, well, I have a full-time regular career. I'm an aspiring screenwriter, so I've been lucky in the sense that I can do that, like on nights and weekends, and I've taken night classes and stuff like that, and um, never really had a desire or notion necessarily to direct any of the stuff that I write, but the more that I sort of talk to people and do research, there's that fear that you know you sort of hand your script over to someone else and you kind of lose all the creative direction of it and it becomes like a commodity. So lately I've been thinking that I should try to learn more of that technical aspect stuff, but I'm wondering, in your opinion, it seems like most of you write and direct your own stuff. How sort of worth it is it for me to sort of invest my own resources and time to learn that part of filmmaking, um, you know? keeping in mind that I've limited resources and stuff like that, or you know, do you have advice for just sort of how, for writers and how to navigate that, that aspect of filmmaking, you know? I, I would say do it only if you're really passionate about directing. I mean, actually, most writers are writing because they want a project to direct. Um, and you're in this amazing, unique position where you just, you just want to write and you want to get your screenplay produced, um, doesn't matter. Even if you're a writer, director, and you have, uh, you know, money, people involved, or whatever, your project's going to change anyway. But um, so it's just going to be a matter of collaboration. But I think if your passion is writing, like just focus on that. And and um, and I'm going to do a big plug for the Tribeca All Access Program at the Tribeca Film Institute. Um, look it up, go home, look it up, um, and they support people just like you and, and um, will help you collaborate with the right people and, and, um, and you, know, you should really do that. But if your passion's writing, you know, focus on it. Don't worry about someone's going to take it and turn it, I mean, you know, it, it, just do the writing. If you're passionate about directing, then definitely go for it. But, you know, I think you're in a good place right now. Hi, so uh, I work at MTV.com and have a very small amount of money to spend on short web docs and spend a lot of time, at least in my off hours, searching for really strong documentary filmmakers and am curious if you would suggest going to any particular sites or festivals to try and track these folks down. Yeah, I think Silver Docs is the easiest. I really do. I think that it's a train right away, and it's all docs. So if docs are, and it and it, it tends to program um, from different festivals. And so Full Frame or Silver Docs, are the festivals that I think of, that are programming all docs that are on a weekend. They're not stretched out over you know a couple weeks, um, that are intensive. I think Tribeca is fantastic. So whatever's local, you obviously should take advantage of. Um, that's my recommendation. I would get on a plane like immediately and go to True False Film Festival in Missouri. It's one of the most brilliantly curated, one of the one of the best festivals in the world. Um, and it's just, I mean, it's run by David Wilson, who's just phenomenal and as a filmmaker and just every, it, it has probably the highest proportion of filmmakers actually introducing and doing Q and A's with their work. Um, and it's just, there's a parade down Main Street. That's how the <laughs> festival opens. Um, and it's in Columbia, Missouri. So it's really intimate and it's, I love True False. So I would say um, True False. It's a, yes. do a documentary festival. So yeah, just True False Film Festival. So.
Hi, um, my name is Noah Wagner. I go to NYU. Um, Mac, you had mentioned something about um, fostering relationships with your funders from the, from the get-go, and I totally agree with that. Um, but in terms of doing fictional filmmaking, especially, like I'm working on my student film right now, um, it's, I find it's kind of tougher to get them on board unless they personally know you or have a personal connection to you, as opposed to documentary, if you have like kind of a philanthropic uh, message or something like that, they can get on board with you. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about getting people maybe excited for your fiction work. So you all should talk. I, I, I never turn your nose up at friends and family as funders, ever. I'm not saying that. <laughs> not even late in career. So, so, I mean, I honestly think that, um, that, that if you do what Sandy said, which is recognize that you are an opportunity and gift and a fun one for them, uh, particularly if you're, if you're a, a tax write-off uh, or investment, um, and you, ch and you treat yourself that way and then treat them with, as partners in the, in the work, uh, particularly if they want to be treated that way, then don't apologize for it. Uh, get excited about it. No, I, w I would say I, that's how I raised money for one of my short films. Um, my thesis film is just asking everybody I know, <laughs> you, know, you know, you know, you should prepare a nice packet and everything, you know, you, you have to treat this like a business transaction, so have a nice packet, have a good bio, have your treatment, um, any past work you've done, have a DVD or something that you can give to them and say, here's my project, and even if it's your mom, I don't care, you know, totally you know, give it to them and say, here's my project, um, you know, I'm looking for this sort of funding, you can, you can break it up into levels, and, um, and then you can use something like Kickstarter, which I haven't done, but um, but definitely like ask as many people as you know. You know, I used to get I got um, catering donated to my film. I got you know people really want to help artists, um, so just just go for it, and everyone you know definitely. Yeah, I mean, I would I would just concur and say that you know you should think about it the same way that documentarians think about raising funds as well. You know. It, having a 501c3 fiscal sponsor, thinking about specific audiences that would be interested in the topic of your film, and then you know, having a great package prepared and, and you know, getting it to those specific people. Like, I just you know, did a narrative short that was at Tribeca last year and, and you know, was basically funded by one main person who, um, was, whose information was given to me by a previous funder of my feature. And so, it, you know, it, it's the same thing about kind of relationship building and sort of cultivating and information, but then also, you know, not having those doors closed and really thinking about who your film speaks to and, and who's gonna, you know, be interested and passionate about it. You just never know, my first grant, um, my first grant, I was PAing on a documentary, the first documentary I worked on, and I was, we were driving around doing pickups, the production manager and, and, and me, and I was just sort of wasting time talking about the film of my dreams, and she had a family foundation, and she said, I'm giving you five grand, you gotta make this thing. So I think that uh, talk, you know, on airplane rides and subway cars and et cetera, and in right here, right now, you know, talk it up. Because if it's good, it's like what I was saying to the woman in the back. If you've got a great idea, then that then then it then it it ought to fly. If you've got stamina and a great idea, uh, it ought to fly. I have a question. Um, I graduated in May, and I've been interning um, for various filmmakers for a little over a year, all unpaid, um, and I've worked part-time jobs to kind of support myself. Um, at what point does it become more valuable for me to just ma make a film than to continue to work for other people for free? Mm -hmm. um, I've been I've been offered a, a potential associate producer credit on with the filmmaker that I'm working with now um, on his next project, but is that credit and the experience that I'm going to get? Do you think more value? I mean, I don't have. My, my problem right now is that I don't have a story in mind that I am dying to tell. Um, but if I find that, should I just kind of go for broke and, not, you know, if I'm going to be broke anyway? <laughs> right. I think when you've got that idea, you ought to be working on that idea. It may be the 10-year plan, but I think that uh, don't when, when one of those sort of magic ideas come to you, 
I jump. I think you can do them simultaneously. I mean, I knew I, when I was, I worked, I used to infiltrate, I'm trying to think the camera's on. I used to infiltrate the Christian right um, and the anti-abortion movement for Planned Parenthood. Um, and I, that was a full-time job. And, um, and then when I was, and I was working on Trembling Before God, and at one point it was just burning, and I could not, I, I, could, I couldn't do the, the job. I had to do the film. And I took that leap and said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fundraise and raise you know, the budget to pay myself as a filmmaker. And, and I think you'll know when that moment, when you just can't do both at the same time, and you just, just fly. I think we're out of time, sadly. So anyway, I want to thank all the panelists for sharing your experiences with us. And thank you all very much for coming. Have a good night.